Good morning. Glad you could be with me. This week we're talking about the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And today I want to concentrate on the calling of his twelve disciples. It is an intriguing subject when you get down to it. First of all, when you take those men and analyze them, they really are a strange group. I mean, most of us wouldn't have called them to be disciples. First of all, they didn't have any academic training. Why didn't Jesus find people who could really help him? I mean, when you look at fellows like Peter and Thomas, not to mention Judas, and Simon the Zealot, all these different sorts of men, and we'll look at that in a minute, but Jesus chose them and just kept them with him, and he taught them. But also, there's more than that. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you too are a disciple. Well, you say, what's a disciple? This is a person who learns, a person under apprenticeship, and a person who learns under supervision. And each one of us needs to be under that supervision of the Holy Spirit. We have been chosen by the Lord our God. We've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, that all being true, we are disciples. And therefore, we need to be under apprenticeship. And I believe one of the things I've seen lacking in my ministry, and I guess it happens to other ministers too, we haven't discipled enough people. They found Jesus Christ as their Savior. They've accepted Him as their Savior and Lord. But then we haven't discipled them. Well, let's have a look carefully at what Jesus did and begin to understand what it is to disciple others. First of all, the men that Jesus called, we find in a number of different lists. But when we look at Luke 6 and verse 12, we find these words. Listen. One of those days, Jesus went out into the hills to pray, and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him. Isn't that great? Before Jesus called the twelve disciples, he went into the mountains and prayed all night. Uh, many of us have a job with five minutes. If we have a big day, it may be ten minutes. Jesus spent the whole night communicating with the Father, and then he went and called his disciples. Well, you say, who did he call? We turn back to Mark chapter 1, and we find in verse 16, it begins to tell us who they were. As Jesus walked along beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. When he'd gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired men and followed him. Isn't that strange? The first four men that Jesus called were all fishermen. And more than that, out of the four fishermen, three of them became his inner cabinet, Peter, James, and John. They saw things and heard things that the other disciples didn't. They went on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they went further than the rest and listened to Jesus as he prayed. Then I find he called someone else. In that same chapter of Mark 1 and verse 14, it tells us that he called a fellow called Levi, or Matthew. Now this is intriguing too. Remember that Matthew was a tax gatherer. And because he was a tax gatherer, once he got up and left his job and followed Jesus, he could never ever go back to it again. You see, those four fishermen could go back if they had to one day. The fish were still there. But once Matthew had left, he'd never have got his job back. Plus the fact that these tax collectors were absolutely hated. After all, they were living among the Jews and working for the Romans. They were not popular. But there's still more. Thomas was called. Thomas the Doubter. I often feel Thomas the Fatalist. What will happen will happen. We might as well go with Jesus. If he's going to die, let's die with him. I know there are a tremendous number of people who are very, very sorry for Thomas. 
Well, poor fellow, maybe, but don't forget he had the same opportunity as all the rest. And I think Thomas had a few hang-ups. I'm looking forward to meeting him. But he called him, and he followed. And he also called Simon the Zealot. Why do I mention him? Well, if you know the history of the Zealots, there's something fascinating here. The Zealots were zealous. They were zealous for the Jewish faith. And they made a blood covenant with one another that if ever they could get their hands on a tax collector, they would kill him. Now, isn't that neat? Here's Matthew and here's Simon. And they're living with Jesus and they're eating with Jesus and they're spending time with Jesus. And Simon never did cut Matthew's throat. In fact, if you look in Acts chapter 1, where the apostles are listed after Jesus has gone back to be with the Father, Matthew and Simon are still there. They're still together in Jesus Christ. So Simon was a zealot and he was caught. Well, why did Jesus call Judas? I have a theory that I can't prove to you. I don't think he knew when he called him that Judas was the one who would betray him. Oh yes, I believe as the ministry progressed, he knew that it was Judas. But I don't think he did initially. Remember, Jesus was totally human. Well, why did he call Judas? I don't think we finally know. Well, you say, so that prophecy could be fulfilled. What? Are you saying to me that the only reason that Judas was one of the twelve was so that he could betray Jesus? Well, that's all right. But don't forget, Judas had free will as much as you have and I have. And it was in the upper room before Judas had even been to the high priest. Jesus said, Woe unto him by whom the Son of Man goeth. He had had the warning, and he still went ahead and betrayed his master. But remember, Jesus was limited in knowledge. And I believe the revelations that he had throughout his ministry, he received from the Holy Spirit, just as you can and I can. The Holy Spirit who dwells within us can show us whatever he wants to show us. Well, what was the program that Jesus called these men to? It says simply this. He called twelve men to be with him. I like that. They were to be with him. And this was the program. And if you hunt through the gospel story, all it says is Jesus called them to be with him. Just to be with him. Well, what did they do? Well, they spent every life situation with Jesus. They were with him when he ate and slept and talked and taught. They were with him when he ministered to people in every situation of life. Well, what did they do? They just observed. They observed how Jesus did things. Well, what else did they do? They were with him to observe his relationships with other people. They were there, and I'm sure John was there, with the woman at the well in Samaria. He saw how Jesus handled a Samaritan. He saw how Jesus handled a woman. He must have been absolutely amazed at the Master and what he did. He saw how Jesus dealt with the scribes and Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And the way Jesus came down on hypocrisy with such strength and such power and how he hated a hypocrite for their hypocrisy. They were with Jesus when he fed the 5,000. In fact, they fed the 5,000, if you remember. Jesus simply gave them a piece of bread and fish and said, Go and do it, and they did it. They never forgot that. They were with Jesus when he went to church, the synagogue, the temple. They were there when the woman put a mite, just a quarter of a cent, into the treasury. And Jesus said, Did you see that? Did you see that woman? She's just put in all she got. And I find the program was to be with him, to be with him, and to be with him. What do you have to do as a disciple? Be with Jesus in every situation of life. Invite him in. Make sure he's there. Make sure he's involved. Just be with him. Be with him all the time. Then I find Jesus sent them out to minister. While he was still on earth, he sent them on a practice run. First of all, twelve were sent out. We find this in Luke 9 and verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure all diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of the God and to heal the sick. 
Here we go again. Here comes the three-pronged ministry of Jesus. And it's the same all the time. It's the ministry he took, the ministry he gave to his disciples, and the ministry he gave to his church. First, we preach the gospel. Secondly, we heal the sick. Thirdly, we deal with the demonic. And I simply don't find anything else. I sometimes look over the orders of service, the bulletins that we produce in our churches, and I seek for the three-pronged ministry of Jesus. Let me ask you, in your church, in your life, is that what's going on? First of all, to preach the gospel. Secondly, to heal the sick. Thirdly, to heal, deal with the demonic. That's where the action is. Then I find that he sent out 72. And interestingly enough, we find this in Luke chapter 10 and verse 6. Let's read it together. Luke 10, verse 6. And it says that he sent out 72 to go into the towns and he says this he says stay in a house if a man of peace is not there your peace will return to you stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages do not move around from house to house when you enter a town and are welcome eat what is set before you here he goes verse 9 heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Now isn't that nice? Off they went, 72. Now notice, he sent them out in twos. And Jesus always does. I believe there's a fellowship for those who work for Jesus Christ. And we're not really meant to work alone. Verse 17 of the same chapter. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. They had a tremendous ministry. These were the new disciples of Jesus. And he sent them out when they had been with him. Some of us try to go out and work for our Lord Jesus before we've been with him. We fail and we fall flat on our faces. I think God calls us to be with Jesus. To spend time with him. And of course, for them, it was observing how he lived. And I think we can do that through the Gospels. Who have you discipled in your life? Who have you shown Jesus to? People need that.